Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Jackie Garino Broda. I'm a physician assistant in the Division of Urology at Texas Children's Hospital. We're going to be discussing enuresis or nighttime bedwetting today. We'll be going over the definitions, the background, evaluation, and treatment of enuresis. In our urology department, we have a clinic called Voiding Improvement Program, our VIP clinic, designated to our patients with diagnoses such as this. This is a really common complaint that we get this time of year as children are going back to school and want to participate in events with their friends, such as sleepovers or campouts. So MG is a nine-year-old male who wets his bed every night. His father remembers bedwetting when he was a child. The father has tried stopping fluids at dinner time and waking him up at night to void, but he continues to have accidents. The school year is about to begin and his friends are inviting him for sleepovers. He'd love to attend, but is nervous about having an accident. Now, enuresis can have a significant effect on the child and the family. It's not uncommon for the child to hide sheets or clothing from their family due to embarrassment or not attend events such as sleepovers and campouts for fear of having an accident. This can be stressful for the family. Families just want their children to feel safe and secure, and they've usually exhausted all efforts, just wanting to get their children dry. This can be incredibly expensive. Doing an extra one to two loads of laundry every week can cost up to $700 a year for families. And doing disposable diapers can easily add up to over $400 a year. The definition of enuresis is when children are having discrete episodes of wetting at nighttime in a child that's six years or older. If they are only having nighttime accidents, this is considered monosymptomatic nocturnal enuresis. If they've had it their entire life, this is considered primary mono, monosymptomatic nocturnal enuresis. If they've had it and then it went away for a period of six months or more and they started having accidents again, this is considered secondary. Now, if a child is having some daytime symptoms, such as incontinence, urgency, frequency, on top of the nighttime accidents, this is considered non-monosymptomatic nocturnal enuresis. The pathogenesis evaluation and treatment can overlap with these, but if they're having daytime symptoms, we must resolve these first before moving on to nighttime. Enuresis is more commonly found in men than females, and it is often inherited. If both parents wet the bed, there's a 77% chance their child will. If one parent was a bedwetter, there's still a 44% chance that their child will wet the bed. If neither parent was a bedwetter, there's still a 15% chance that their child will wet the bed. Now when we say inherited, we don't mean just the parents. This could be inherited from aunt, an uncle, a cousin, any of those could be included. I want to let all of our patients know that this is actually really common. Between 5 and 7 million children over the age of 5 have enuresis as well. It's important to let us to make sure that the child knows that they aren't alone in this. So why does this happen? There are many different reasons for this. It can be nocturnal polyuria, detrusor overactivity, high arousal threshold, small functional bladder capacity, and others. And sometimes it's a combination of all of these. It is not due to poor parenting, and it is not due to laziness of the child. No child wants to wake up wet. Nocturnal polyuria is an important pathogenesis factor behind enuresis. Polyuria may be linked to the absence of vasopressin secretion at nighttime. You can see that a dry child has an increase of vasopressin at nighttime, where the enuretic children tend to have a decrease of vasopressin during the nighttime. The yellow line indicates the volume of urine produced. In normal urine production, that increase in vasopressin helps us make less urine at nighttime. Where children with nocturnal polyuria lack this increase of vasopressin and therefore make as much or more urine at nighttime and they just aren't able to hold all this urine in their bladder overnight. In normal functional bladder, what happens is the detrusor contraction comes only after the pelvic floor voluntary, voluntarily relaxes and the contraction continues until the bladder is completely emptied. Detrusor overactivity is characterized as a sudden, involuntary contraction of the bladder, which can result in urgency, incontinence, or both. 
Some children can have detrusor overactivity throughout the night. So the issue isn't so much that they have a full bladder, but they have an increased propensity to have a detrusor contractions throughout the nighttime, which can lead to enuresis. Many parents will say that their children are deep sleepers. The issue isn't so much that the child is a deep sleeper, but they have a high arousal threshold and it is difficult for them to wake up. So for a dry child, they tend to wake up easily to the feeling of having a full bladder and can get up and go to the bathroom. Where children with a high arousal threshold have a hard time waking up to that feeling, can sleep through it, and therefore have accidents. Some children can have a small functional bladder capacity. So if we take our patient, for example, MG, he's nine years old, his expected bladder capacity is 330 cc's. If he was only able to make 300 cc's or less, he would have a small functional bladder capacity and unable to hold as much urine at nighttime, which can result in enuresis. Now constipation can be a factor as well that contributes to this. We consider constipation to be if you are not having a small, soft bowel movement every day. We have our patients characterize what the bowel movements are based on a Bristol stool chart. When the rectum is full and distended with constipation, it presses on the bladder. Anytime the bladder is being pressed on, it's gonna cause the bladder to leak urine. Now other things can contribute to this as well, such as stress, changes at home or in the school, obstructive sleep apnea, diabetes, or other comorbidities such as constipation and psychiatric issues. I let all my patients know that most of them will grow out of this. Every year they have an additional 15% chance of outgrowing this. By age 10, 5% of patients will continue to have bedwetting. By age 15, 1 to 2% will continue to wet the bed. So in our voiding improvement program clinic, in our VIP clinic, we want to do a full thorough evaluation. We want to look at what their general health is. What are their developmental milestones? If a child is delayed in their developmental milestones, it's not uncommon for continence to be delayed as well. Are they having any urinary tract infections? When did this begin? Is this new or has it always been going on? What other bladder symptoms are they having? Any urgency, frequency, incontinence? These are things that we want to evaluate. We also want to look at the bowels. How often are they having a bowel movement? What's the consistency? And are they having any encopresis? We also want to look at their behavior. Are there any changes at home or school? Any recent move or anything that would be significant enough to affect the child? Have they tried any previous treatments, such as waking the child up at night to go to the bathroom, or an alarm or medication? And if so, how was this done? We also want to evaluate other things. Is the child a deep sleeper? Is there a family history of bedwetting? And how motivated is the child? This is especially important. Evaluating the motivation of the child is one of the best predictors on how well the child will do. If the child is not motivated to become dry, getting them dry is going to be that much harder. For all of our patients, we want to do a full thorough physical exam, looking at the abdomen, the genitalia, the back, the spine, and even rectal if you're concerned for constipation. All of our patients get a urine analysis, and if we're concerned for an infection, we'll send it for a culture. If there is any concern about non-monosymptomatic nocturnal enuresis, we can get a renal bladder ultrasound and an x-ray of the abdomen and spine. If there's any concern about diabetes, we can send that for labs. And if any concern for other daytime symptoms, of course, we can also gather more information with a Euroflow. All of our patients fill out voiding charts. Voiding charts are incredibly helpful. We ask the patient to fill out during the daytime how often they're going to the bathroom and if they're having any accidents. What are their bowel movements look like? What's the number on the bristle stool chart and when is it happening? What nights are they having the accidents and when are they drinking fluid and how much? This is gonna help us correlate all of their symptoms with what's going on so we can see if we can make adjustments for them. So when should you refer to urology clinic or avoiding improvement program? As pediatricians, your clinics are incredibly full and it's hard to see patients and give them the full time of counseling and coming up with a plan for them. In our avoiding improvement program, each patient is seen in 40 minute visits for their initial visit. Every follow-up appointment is 20 minutes. This allows us to get a very thorough physical exam, history, and help the family come up with a plan together. Now we think you should at any point for any child six years or older that is affected by the enuresis, whether it be stress, anxiety, that means it's time to come into the clinic. 
And in our clinic, we can involve other specialties as needed, such as endocrine, ENT, GI or psychiatry if needed. For all of our patients that come in, we wanna let them know that this is not their fault. We wanna explain why this is happening and remove the guilt. We wanna make sure that they're having regular daytime habits, such as going to the bathroom regularly during the day. We wanna make sure that they're increasing their morning fluid intake so we can decrease the amount of fluids that they're drinking at nighttime. We wanna ensure that we're cutting off fluids at dinner time and having them void an hour before bed and then right before bed. There are many th therapies that we can offer our patients. It is absolutely fine to not choose any therapy for the patient, especially if the child and family are not bothered by this. But we do have first line therapies for our patients. The first is the enuresis alarm. This has the most cure potential for our patients. And it is best worked in families who are incredibly motivated and in children who wet most nights of the week. It does require a lot of time and motivation on the part of the family and the child. The way that it works is there is a clip or a sensor that clips to the part of the underwear that would get wet first. And another clip that would clip to the shirt in patients um, so it's close to their ear and that's the alarm portion. Now initially they will still have accidents. When the sensor feels the wetness, it'll send off an alarm. When the child hears the alarm, they should get up and go to the bathroom. The reason that this is going to involve the parents is because if the child has a high arousal threshold, it will be hard for them to wake up to this sound. So the parents need to help get them up and have them go to the bathroom. Our patients need to use this consistently every single night for at least two to three months or until they have 14 dry consecutive days. Now, if a child isn't dry after that period of time, we don't want them to get rid of it because we may come back to it later. The other option that we have is Desmopressin or DDAVP, which is an antidiuretic hormone. It is easy to use, it is quick and effective, but it has no cure potential. It is best used in kids who have nocturnal polyuria. The way that we have the, our patients take this medication is they can choose to take it on just the nights that they want to be dry or every single night if they never wanna have an accident because this medication is only going to mask the symptoms and it's only gonna work on the nights that they take it. So we have our patients start by taking one pill a night or 0.2 milligrams. They can take this every night for a week. If they are dry on one pill, one pill is their dose. If not, we can go up to 0.4 milligrams or 0.6 milligrams if needed. Once they have their dose, again, they can choose to take it every single night to never have an accident or only on those special occasions. Now, this is a safe medication if we take it the right way. What I mean by that is that the patient can take this pill an hour before bedtime with a sip of water, but they can't drink any water until they wake up in the morning or eight hours later and when they're thirsty again. Now this is important because if this medication, desmopressin, is concentrating the urine, but if the child were to drink a lot of water, it could cause them to become hyponatremic, which could have very serious side effects. So we want to ensure that your patient is able to follow the rules before taking this medication. Now if our patients fail these therapies, we want to back up. We want to evaluate them again. See if they use the alarm, did we use it correctly? And again, if it didn't work, we may come back to it later, so don't get rid of it. We want to evaluate for constipation, heavy snoring, look at their fluid intake, reevaluate avoiding chart. If needed, if we haven't gotten an ultrasound, we can consider it getting it at this point. And if they have new, any new daytime symptoms, we can always evaluate with a Euroflow if needed and consider involving other subspecialties at this point, such as psychiatry. Now there is a second line. For our patients who have maxed out on their desmopressin, or the three pills of desmopressin, 0.6 milligrams, we can add a medication called oxybutynin. Oxybutynin is an anticholinergic medication. So the child is clearly still making urine at nighttime. And they're leaking, and one of the reasons why they might be leaking is because they are having those bladder contractions. So oxybutynin medication decreases those bladder spasms and increases the functional capacity. Now because this is an anticholinergic medication, we have to consider the side effects. Flushing of the face, dry mouth, constipation, and urine retention. So you wanna ensure that your child is not constipated and you wanna ensure that they're emptying well with a bladder scanner before we start this medication. The way we have our patients take the medication is that they're on three pills of desmopressin. They can add one pill of oxybutynin or five milligrams that they take every night for a week. If they're dry on this dose, they can take it again 
as needed or every single night to always be dry. If they're not dry on that, you can go up to 10 milligrams and 15 milligrams that you would add in addition to the Desmopressin. Now we do have a third line therapy for our patients as well, which is imipramine. Imipramine is a tricyclic antidepressant. The side effects of this medication can be insomnia and mood swings. Now, before starting imipramine, we always want to get an EKG as it can prolong QT. We also want to make sure that the parents are the ones who are giving this medication to the child every night, especially because it has a cardiotoxic potential if it were overdosed. So we have to ensure that this medication is kept in the parent's medicine cabinet and that they are giving it to the child every single day. This is not a medication to take lightly. We want to ensure that we have compliance from both the patient and the family before starting this medication. So if we go back to our patient, MG, he has a strong family history of bedwetting. He is a deep sleeper, his exam and urinalysis were normal, and he was highly motivated to become dry. So he chose a long-term solution for his aneuresis with a bedwetting alarm, but also wanted an option so that he could attend events such as sleepovers and campouts in the meantime before he got dry and chose to do desmopressin as needed on those dates, which made him incredibly excited to go back to school and do these events with his friends. So in conclusion, aneurysis is common in the pediatric population. Therapy is targeted to both the patient and their family, and it is acceptable to do no treatment at all if it doesn't bother patient and the family. We just wanna offer our patients all the options so that they can have the option to be dry and participate in the activities that they want to, such as sleepovers and camps. We want them to feel safe and secure and getting back to all the fun things that they want to enjoy.